How good do you think you are at detecting emotion? One challenge comes from the fact that the same exact face can be used in different emotions. We might be screaming in disgust, screaming in fear, screaming in celebration, screaming from happiness, or screaming from frustration. Same face, different emotions. Another challenge is that the same emotion can have many faces. When we're happy, we laugh, cry, smile, scream, have all kinds of facial expressions. Have you ever struggled over which emoji best matches your emotion? Have you ever had the feeling that none of them are just right? Have you ever received an emoji on its own and have had no idea what it actually means? If so, you're facing exactly the same problem neuroscientists have faced for the last 25 years when studying emotion. The emotions we think we detect in others are just our brains guessing, automatically and naturally. We see a person's face, her body, the situation she's in, and our brains try to guess what she's experiencing. Sometimes our brains guess right, meaning our guess matches the brain state that she's in. But sometimes our brains guess wrong. The truth is that no one detects emotion in anyone else. Not you, not me, not judges or juries, not AI algorithms, not polygraph machines. As a scientist, I have to tell you, emotions are not what we think they are. Why is understanding the true nature of emotion so important? And why is it important to distinguish it from emotion perception? If the cameras in an airport are trying to detect your emotions using algorithms for your face, you might be suspected of being a terrorist because you have the wrong kind of smile. Women over the age of 65 die more frequently from heart attacks when compared to men because when they go to the hospital, with pain in their chest, they and the emergency room physicians are more likely to interpret that pain as evidence of an anxiety attack. And so women are sent home and subsequently have a heart attack and die. Harrowing evidence against televangelist Nigerian pastor Timothy Omotoso. Zondi told the court that Omotoso sexually groomed her for years. The defense cross examined her on her demeanor, saying that she didn't look fearful. Zondi says she concealed her fear. She was 14 years old. Other studies show that in a rape trial, if the judge and the jurors believe that a woman is angry instead of grieving or feeling shame, then the defendant is more likely to receive a lighter sentence if he's found guilty at all. Every scientific journey begins with the felt experience of a human. We used to believe that illness was caused by spirits or curses or miasma in the air until we engineered tools that allowed us to see microscopic viruses and bacteria invisible to the naked eye. Even then, we miss the truth, believing that these tiny creatures were the sole cause of illness. In fact, the true nature of disease emerges from a complex relationship between microbes and our own immune systems, which are normally hidden from our experience. In the same way, the science of emotion started with human experience. It feels like emotions happen to you, that you react to something, that something in the world triggers a little circuit inside your brain. But the true nature and complexity of emotion is much more fascinating than our own experience lets on. Under the hood, emotions are not built into your brain from birth. They are built by your brain in specific situations from a set of basic ingredients. You have a predicting brain, a body that causes you to feel affect, and a set of shared concepts that are absorbed into your brain as it develops throughout your lifetime.
When you see this pounding and clapping, your brain is filling in the gaps. There's no sound here. And if you're a fan of the rock group Queen, your brain might even start predicting This filling in of gaps is prediction, and it's how your brain works all the time. Have a look at this. Right now, your brain is working like crazy, searching through a lifetime of experience, making thousands of guesses at once, weighing the probabilities to try and figure out what this is most like. Not what is this, but what is this most like from your past experience? If you still see black and white blobs, then you are in a state that scientists call experiential blindness. Want to be cured of your blindness? So now, many of you see food on a table. Cherries at the bottom, lemons and oranges at the top and to the right, lettuce on the left, and a little bit of ginger peeking out from the bottom left. Why do you see these black and white blobs differently than you did a moment ago? What you see is a combination of what is on the screen and what is in your head. Your brain is doing something really remarkable. It's changing the firing of its own neurons. So you experience cherries and lemons and lettuce when all that's there is a bunch of blobs. So believe it or not, this is not a trick. This is a special example that we built to reveal to you how your brain actually works under the hood. Every waking moment of your life, your brain is using past experiences to predict and create your current experiences. Prediction is why some people see a dress that's black and blue while others see a dress that's gold and white. It all depends on whether your brain is predicting that you're seeing the dress in the morning or in the evening. Your predicting brain is why you daydream. It's how you imagine all the ways you might save the day. Or win an argument you've yet to have with someone. In every waking moment, your brain is doing its best to guess what will happen next. If your brain didn't predict, then sports couldn't exist. A soccer ball can be kicked faster than 100 kilometers per hour, but our eyes have a delay up to 190 milliseconds or even longer. In the space of that delay, the ball has moved 5.3 meters, Think of how much faster a baseball or a hockey puck goes. Many predictions are at a micro level. Your predicting brain is guessing how much water and salt and glucose your body needs to stay alive and healthy, predicting the meaning of bits of light, it's guessing whether the rustling in the grass is a wild animal or just the wind. Every time you hear speech, like right now, your brain breaks up the continuous stream of sounds into phonemes, syllables, words, and ideas, all by using prediction. Other predictions are at the macro level. You're interacting with a friend and, based on context, your brain predicts that the two of you will smile at each other. So, you smile first in anticipation of her smile. Your movement then causes her brain to issue new predictions and guide new actions back and forth in a dance of prediction and movement. Predictions are automatic, effortless, and you have no sense that you're doing them. Yet they make sense of the world in a quick and efficient way. Without them, we'd be deaf and blind. For many years, scientists believed 
that your neurons spend most of their time asleep and wake up only when stimulated by something in the world. Now we know that all your neurons are firing constantly, nudging one another at various rates. This is called intrinsic brain activity, and it's one of the great discoveries of modern neuroscience. Even more compelling is that this intrinsic brain activity represents millions of predictions of what you will experience next based on all the experience of your past. These predictions all combine into a simulation of the outside world. Prediction turns shapes and sounds into trees and grass and runners. Your brain predicts a honk is from a car or a honk is from a goose. There's no sound here. What you're experiencing is a consequence of your brain simulating the world. Scientists sometimes call this perceptual inference. because these predictions are filling in gaps of information that are missing. In fact, seeing something can cause your brain to predict what it will taste like. what it will smell like. What it will feel like. Your brain is predicting all the time, effortlessly, automatically, because predictions are more efficient than reactions. Combining past experiences to create your simulations of the world. And these simulations are the basis for all your experiences and all your actions. This is your predicting brain in action. So why is it important that you understand that your brain is predicting instead of reacting? The answer is pretty simple. If you understand how something works, you'll be able to go in and tinker with it. Prediction is the key ingredient that your brain is using to process two other ingredients that are necessary for your brain to make motions. When you wake up in the morning, how do you feel? Do you feel good, energetic, or do you feel crappy, like you want to get back into bed? It might sound crazy, but how you're feeling, your mood, influences what you see and what you hear. Your brain is wired in this way. In fact, 
every sense that you have in every waking moment of your life is colored by how you feel. And it has very powerful consequences. Scientists have a name for this ingredient in our lives, affect. Now, affect is not emotion, it's more basic than emotion. And affect exists because one of your brain's most important jobs is running a budget for your body. It's keeping track of your glucose and oxygen, water, salt, hormones, immune system, and all the other stuff to keep you alive and well. This body budgeting is transformed into a fuzzy mental feeling called affect, or what we sometimes call mood. Affect is with you every waking moment of your life. This chart is a good visualization of its two aspects. Valence is how pleasant or unpleasant you feel. Are you watching one of your favorite shows? Are you feeling just neutral? Or are your muscles sore? Or does it feel like you're coming down with a cold? Good, bad, great, crappy. <coughs> Arousal is like your energy level. Maybe you're just sitting there calmly. Maybe you just woke up from a deep sleep. Maybe you're at a bumping party. No matter where you are or what you're doing, you are experiencing affect. It's a simple barometer of your body budget without a lot of detail. So if you came to our lab, we could make you feel pleasant or unpleasant without your awareness. We could change your affect. I can't tell you how we do it. That's kind of a scientific trade secret. But if we made you feel more pleasant, and then we showed you neutral faces, you would experience those people as more trustworthy, more likable, more attractive. And if we made you feel unpleasant without your awareness, you would look at those exact same people and experience them as less trustworthy, less dependable, less likable, less attractive. Why do you see what you feel? Because your brain is using predictions which become what you see to make sense of your affect. If you have a funny feeling in the pit of your stomach and you feel uncomfortable and it's about noontime, your brain might predict that hunger is the cause of your affect. And so you will feel hungry. That same funny, uncomfortable feeling right before a big speech might lead your brain to predict that you're nervous. And if you're on a date, your brain might predict that you're really into this person, feeling hot and bothered, losing yourself in their eyes. Or you could just be coming down with the flu. And if you're a jury member in a courtroom, that unpleasant ache, well, it might lead your brain to create a gut feeling that a defendant is guilty. And remember, Affect isn't just an ingredient in your brain. Every person on this planet is always feeling some sort of affect, a certain level of energy, and a certain amount of pleasantness or unpleasantness every single moment of their lives because of what they ate for breakfast, because of how little they slept the night before. The state of your body which you experience as affect, is another important ingredient that your brain is using to construct emotions, and really to construct every waking moment of your life. So the next time that you run into someone and you find them particularly irritating or annoying, or you meet someone for the first time and you think, wow, I love this person, remember that you are experiencing the world through affect colored glasses.
When the sun comes out after it rains, we sometimes see a rainbow. Rainbows are beautiful and mysterious. When we draw a rainbow in a simple way, we use stripes of color, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. In reality, a rainbow has no stripes. It's a continuum of light, uninterrupted, without borders. There are no lines. The human brain draws these lines, creating the concept of red, of orange, and so on. These concepts allow us to easily communicate with each other. And people in different cultures draw the lines of a rainbow in different places. People who speak Russian draw a line between dark blue and light blue. These colors exist for some people, but not for others. That's because your brain, my brain, and the brains of people all around the world carve the same rainbow into different colors. Brains automatically construct color concepts. All we have to do to make them real is to share them with each other. These concept boundaries determine what you experience as similar and what you experience as different. We don't just draw lines for colors. In our everyday lives, we consider these as fruits and these as vegetables. You might have heard that a tomato is actually a fruit. And that's because to a botanist, a scientist who studies plants, fruits are the edible parts of a plant that carry the seeds. All of these foods are actually fruits. When a botanist is talking to another botanist, she'll refer to all of these as fruits. But when she's cooking dinner for her friends, they become vegetables. Even the concept of food itself is constructed by a culture. Of course, there are limits. Human agreement can't make glass edible, even if you put ketchup on it. But how about grubs? I would call an exterminator if I saw this on my plate in Boston. But if I were in Iquitos, Peru, this might be my lunch. A human brain, in the context of other human brains, creates different concepts in different cultures. Words play an essential role in efficiently constructing concepts. They're like a cheat sheet. They allow us to communicate and share our concepts with each other with little effort. If I say the word flower and you know some English, your brain will spontaneously and automatically start using your past experience with flowers to predict what to do with this plant. When we were young, the people in our lives might have first taught us that this is a flower. We learn rules for when it's appropriate and inappropriate to see a plant as a flower. You put a flower in a vase. You share a flower with someone you like to make them smile. You give a flower to someone who's sad at the loss of a loved one. A flower is a magical, part of nature. A weed is a menace. It invades your garden. It ruins your lawn. Weeds are not to be cultivated. They are to be yanked out from the ground by their roots. One person's weed is another person's salad. The same plant can be a flower, a weed, or a salad, all depending on the predictions that your brain creates in different situations. It's a continuum of plant, uninterrupted, without borders. When your brain sees a dandelion, it asks itself, what is this most similar to in my past experience in this sort of a situation? As your brain is automatically making a slew of predictions about what this might be similar to, what it might be like, it's creating a concept.
My parents are immigrants. They are from the Dominican Republic originally. And I've always kind of lived in a Latino-centric community, Florida. When I came to Italy, uh, I was working in, in one bar as a waitress. And um, <laughs> my face was still Russian. <laughs> so they asked, they told me, oh, this face, you live at home. No, 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 here you have to smile. So I start smiling force. I was, I was forcing myself to smile. <laughs> Even like when we smile, you know, like this, it's like a natural like way to connect with everyone with any different language. For me, what is to be Russian or Ukrainian is, it, it means to be very close. Face should be, because if you if you smile in Russian, maybe you're stupid. <laughs> you just smile at someone, they, like most likely they're gonna smile back at you. And it's like the most simple thing to do. Because language is based off of not just a need for people to communicate with each other, but a common ground. It's just in Chinese culture, we tend to, we're not so expressive, but we, we are expressive, but there's lots of um, like, suppressed feelings, right? Um, especially among families and uh, um, these expectations and the showing love when we don't really say, oh, I love you, dad, I love you always. So there's like way to show it. I, I'm already half an Italian because <laughs> all Italian emotions are in me. <laughs> so, and all, and they push away the <laughs> Ukrainian Russians emotions away because it's it's there obviously like we love each other but we don't express it and we feel it's very che like cheesy to say all the time and then feel we always feel like doing is more practical than saying it yeah say like just talking about it is cheap so an emotion is built with a concept a concept that your brain creates the way it creates any other concept using its predictive powers. On the basis of past experience, it makes a concept that allows you to make sense of what's going on inside your own body in relation to what's going on around you outside in the world. Some people routinely construct a few simple concepts. Good, bad, great, crappy. Words are a shortcut. Your brain can make many more concepts than you have words for. But words make it easy. With a few more words, our emotions become a little more precise. Add some more and you get a tapestry of precise emotions that are tailored like a perfectly fitting dress to a specific situation. Carving affect into emotion concepts is like drawing lines on the rainbow. We're creating concepts that help us make sense of the world and share that meaning with each other. The ability to create and share concepts is a uniquely human superpower. You didn't know that you had a superpower, did you? And this superpower is what you use to create emotions. We can construct new concepts about the world anytime we like. All we have to do to make them real is share them with each other. larger vocabulary, larger toolbox of concepts, more expertise in making emotions. The word for love is te amo. 
Te quiero is something between I like you and I love you. It means that, you know, I, I, I need your presence here at this very moment and I yearn for it because we get along so well, because we, we vibe. And that is something that, you know, boyfriends say to girlfriends or girlfriends say to vice versa or any way. Something that husbands say to wives. It's something that uh, fathers say to sons and mothers say to daughters. 就是我觉得很沉重，就很沉重的感觉。But like I said, there's so many things behind it. I don't know. Do do say like like oh how are you? Like I feel loaded, right? Like I I, I yeah I feel loaded or I'm heavy. Tristesse is a、uh, sadness.、Mm -hmm. I don't. I feel like tristesse is more deep <laughs> than, than sadness. Sorry, for Americans and English speakers. So one implication of this way of understanding how brains work in in bodies in the context of other human brains and bodies、um, is that we are social animals. We regulate each other's body budgets. We influence each other's affect in ways that we are really unaware of. You know, the best thing for your nervous system is another human. And the worst thing for your nervous system is another human. You may not realize it, but what's going on around you in the outside world prompts your brain to create certain predictions. So the next time that you're feeling a little crappy, overwhelmed by the situation, just feeling a little tired, a simple way to change your emotions. Is to change your context. You can get up, go for a walk. You can call a friend. You can turn off your phone. You can pay attention to things around you in the world that a moment ago you weren't noticing. All of these things change your environment, and that will change your predictions. So. When I started to do work on this topic, I used to get this question a lot, and at first the question kind of irritated me. As a scientist, I thought, well, why should anybody care that people are using the wrong understanding of emotion? Well, because you should be curious about how things work, right? We don't ask physicists why they study the universe. We don't say why is it important for human life that we know that the Higgs boson exists. I felt like. A little defensive, honestly. Like, well, I'm a scientist. Science is interesting. Just be interested by the science. But then, when I actually sat down and thought about it for a few minutes, I realized if people are using the wrong understanding of emotion, they can get hurt, and other people can get hurt too. And I think the best example of this, to me, is in the law, in the legal system. In the United States. Uh, as in many other countries, a person will only get a fair trial if the jurors and the judge can、uh, know the heart and mind, the intention of the defendant. That means the jurors have to look at a defendant and basically make guesses about what that defendant is thinking and feeling. So defendants move their faces, they move their bodies, they say words, and jurors are not reading emotion. They're not detecting emotion. They are inferring emotion. And if they infer incorrectly,、uh, the defendant may not get a fair trial. So sometimes this means that guilty people go free, and other times it means 
that innocent people uh, go to prison and sometimes they lose their lives. So in my house, a couple of neuroscience concepts have been really important. People have just adopted them um, in the lab too, I would say. Uh, one is the idea of prediction error. You know, your brain is always predicting, so your brain is always guessing, right? It's always perceiving, um, and it's always inferring what the sights and sounds and smells and so on around you mean. So uh, oftentimes we have prediction errors. Our brains make a prediction, and something doesn't materialize when we expect it to, or it does when we don't expect it. And so we talk to each other about prediction errors. Uh, and that's a way of indicating that you've made a mistake, but that it wasn't intentional. Another concept that's useful that comes from science, actually comes from Bayesian statistics, is the notion of priors. So if your brain is using your past experience to make predictions about your current experience, it's using prior experiences, your priors. So your priors are like the expectations that you come with. Really, it refers to the predictions that your brain is making that are really like your, your brain's hypothesis for what is about to happen, your brain's expectations. Um, and it's just a way of saying, I'm, it's a way of acknowledging that I'm coming to a situation with a set of expectations. I'm not a blank slate. Everything I hear, everything I see, everything you say, uh, I am processing through a set of priors. I try not to assert that what someone else is feeling or thinking as if I'm recognizing how they feel or what is on in their minds because my brain doesn't recognize, my brain perceives. Your brain doesn't recognize, it perceives. And it's really more respectful to someone else to use the language of perception uh, as opposed to making clear, strong statements as if you know how someone else feels. So many of us, you know, have a sense of confidence that we know how other people feel, that we know what they're thinking. That sense of confidence is uh, just a feeling. It's not actually evidence that you're right. So I try not to say, you're angry. I might say, are you angry? Or you look as if you're angry, or you sound as if you're angry. When, I, when I'm angry, I try not to communicate to someone that I know they're a certain way, you know? I don't say to my husband, you're an asshole. I might say, I'm experiencing you as an asshole. Or I might say, I'm feeling angry at you right now. And I think this works most of the time. I think the only time it really doesn't work is when I'm on the highway and someone cuts me off and then I'm absolutely sure that the person who cut me off is a complete asshole. Uh, but even then I try to remind myself, well, maybe that person uh, has, a really, has to be somewhere really, uh, maybe that person has to be somewhere really urgently. Maybe that person has a sick parent or a sick mother. Maybe that person was listening to the radio and actually didn't see me. Right? It isn't really the case that just because you feel as if someone has harmed you, that their intent was to harm you.